Well, hello everyone. This is Jason Cisco, and this is our High Noon broadcast. And we welcome you to another edition of our daily increments of prayer and following after God with all of our hearts, of opening up the Word of God and using it as our blueprint and our foundation. We are reminded that all problems are prayer problems. God does nothing except in response to a prayer. So again, we welcome you and we're so thankful uh, as you're joining us uh, all over uh, Southeast Texas. We're so thankful for those that are connecting from Houston, uh, from all around the Harris County uh, area of Texas, and of course, our Church Triumphant family uh, with our foundation stone, our our, our, our main campus being 1030 Strawberry Road in Pasadena. So we're live again today and we welcome you uh, for, uh, for all of our faithful intercessors that connect with us. We have many of you that join with us every single day all around uh, the United States. And of course, we have many nations that join with us as well. It is always a joy. I'm seeing some from Arkansas today. I think that's great. I think that's a new one. Uh, we haven't had Arkansas in a while, but thankful uh, for anyone that joins with us, uh, whether you're watching from Baytown or Louisiana or El Salvador, uh, we're, we're so blessed to have you and we see you often. We're so thankful. Ohio is joining in with us. We have Florida joining in. Uh, so many people just coming and being a part of this. When you watch this later, uh, we're so thankful for those of you that cannot be with us live, but you watch often. I know many uh, cannot come during the, the noon time, but they uh, watch later. I'm seeing Germany joining us. God bless you. I know it's not noon in Germany, uh, but we're so thankful for those that can watch in whatever time zone that you're watching from. So we're going to start today, uh, as I often do, I, I always want to uh, put our mind in the right place. We have had some that have asked for our notes. I don't have notes prepared for you yet, but we are working on uh, some of these things to make them available for you as simple guides. We do have a few of these concepts um, in, in, in uh, some kind of a PDF form that we're hoping to be able to make available for those that, uh, that would like it. I have the blessing of Asher, the five blessings of Asher. Uh, we have made those available to churches at different points. And uh, we'll, we're, we're still working on uh, making those available for those uh, in an updated form uh, for those of you that want that. Want that. But we're, we're, we've been praying a lot. We've been using the Word of God a lot. And if you've been watching consistently, there's a lot of things that we've been able to share with you from the Word of God. And it is just, um, it is so refreshing to know that God is a right now God and that whatever we need he gives us the strength for this day and for this time. So we're so thankful for that. So let's start by lifting our hands, by lifting our voices, and let's invite God into this process today, into our prayer time, into our agreement with each other, that we can be in the focus of what is his will for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for symphonia. We thank you, Lord, for that agreement that we share together. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that there is a, a blessed hope and an assurance that we have in our souls, that we are just strangers and we are just pilgrims in this world. We're in this world, but we are not of this world. Heaven is our home and we have a great anticipation of you coming back to get us. We're thankful, oh Jesus, that there is a promise of a rapture. We thank you, Lord. But even more than that right now, our hope is for as many souls as possible to be saved, for as many people to be reached as can be reached. We want to see our generation experience the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the new birth experience, the whole gospel for the whole world by the whole church. Lord Jesus, we bind every resisting spirit, whether it's human or demonic, that would stand in the way of the revelation of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would hide me, Lord, behind you, that they would not see me, but they would see you, that they would not hear me, but they will hear you. And it will not be my spirit that will be most obvious, but it will be your spirit that will take this stage. Father, we thank you that there is a great shift that's happening in the spirit right now. And we are anticipating, oh God, what you are about to do in the earth because you are faithful. And you are, you are the, the power to overcome living on the inside that we can literally have an identity as being overcomers. 
that we are the church triumphant. That's what you've named us for the end times, regardless of whatever local congregations uh, we use for our name. Oh God, our name ultimately is triumphant and victorious that we're going to close out this age. We're going to close out this dispensation in a glorious end time harvest and revival. So now we align ourselves today. We submit ourselves to you, spirit and soul and body. We pray, Lord, that our eyes would see in the spirit, our ears would hear, that we would smell the fragrance of the presence of God, that we would taste and see that you are good, that we would feel after you and find you, though you be not far from any one of us. We pray that our minds would be renewed today. Take your hands and just put it on your head just for a moment right now. And let's pray for our minds to be renewed. We pray, Father, that we would not be conformed to this world, but we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds in the name of Jesus, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We want to be swallowed up with your will. Oh God, let your will, oh God, be dominant in us, Lord Jesus. Strengthen us to be obedient. Strengthen us to say yes. Oh God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus that we would have your thoughts that we would have your heart, that we would have your passion, that we would love what you love and hate what you hate. We worship you today because you are perfect. We thank you, Father, that you hear us always. We praise you because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We were made in your image and made in your likeness. We were designed for the divine. We were made to be a habitation of God, that your spirit could come and dwell within us. Oh, how thoughtful and how gracious you are. Oh, how long-suffering and merciful you are, O oh, Heavenly Father. We thank you that there is no limit. We thank you, God, that there is no ceiling, that there is, oh God, nothing that is too difficult for you. We praise you that you have all the resources, that you have all the wealth. You said in your word, all the gold is mine and the silver is mine, says the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. That's why you can say the glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former. I want you to thank him for his promises right now. I want you to thank him for all of the yeses that he's given to us. I want you to thank God right now for strength. You might feel a little bit weak right now. So pray it prophetically. Praise him in advance for what you anticipate him doing in your lives. That's the greatest expression of mature faith. So this is what we're doing just to start it today. Father, we are thanking you that you have heard our prayers. We thank you, God, that COVID is being defeated. We know, God, that there are many cases that are, that are coming up. The numbers are coming up. But we thank you, Father, that there is a victory that's on the way. We thank you, Father, that it is being suppressed. It is being defeated. And its power over us is being de destroyed. We might have some physical limitations still that we feel. But emotionally, God, we are getting on top of this. Mentally, we are getting on top of this. And we're able to pray more effectively for those that are sick right now. And I thank you, Father, for healings. I thank you for sending your angels. I thank you for your promises, which are yea and amen. I thank you that you are Jehovah Nisai, our banner and our victory. Jehovah Shalom, you are our peace. I thank you, Father, you are Sidkanu, you are righteousness. You are M Kadesh, you are holiness. Father, we thank you, you are Jireh, our provider. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are all in all that you are the Alpha and Omega, the author and finisher of our faith. We praise you that if you got us this far, you wouldn't bring us this far to leave us. We thank you, Lord, that I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed out bringing bread. I thank you, Father, that your word says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all in Jesus' name. Let's just clap our hands to the Lord. Let's give him praise right now. Would you do that in Jesus' name? In Jesus' name. Or we could just continue on in that flow, and, and it's beautiful. But I'm going to kind of get you into this revelation knowledge of what we're praying today and how we're praying today. And the Bible says in book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 1, and I love this. My dad taught me this principle many years ago of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So Jesus first began it. The book of Acts is the continuation of Jesus's ministry. That's what we're doing. There's no amen at the end of the book of Acts. So therefore, that means that the church history is still being written. Will our names be in that book? Will our names be written in that history? 
So some like to read history, others like to make history. I believe that it is the will of God for us as a movement, for us to be able to experience uh, God doing things in our lifetime that are worth writing down. They're worth writing down. Uh, just on a side note, I do recommend that you have your own prayer journal of some kind where you can write down your promises, write down the prophetic words, and um, it's always very helpful to help process. Whenever you receive a word from God, you take that back into the presence of God, and then you recite it again. And this is what David did when Nathan told him he couldn't build the house, but God would build him a house. And so uh, we take that word and we recite that word in the presence of God because how God meant it and how it was actually spoken to us or how it came to us uh, oftentimes has uh, two different meanings. And so God will bring clarification. There's also an opportunity for confirmation of those words. And the more confirmations we get of those words, the more sure we are of that word, the more it is established in us and the more uh, we can bank on it that it is going to come to pass. And then it becomes a part of our whole processing that it becomes a part of our identity. And so we're talking about uh, a shifting our identity. This has been a, a process that we have been in from the very beginning. I did a whole session on transformational leadership. So again, today we're talking a little bit about open doors and insights and who our next generation leaders are. Who are the people that are going to take the day? Who are the people that are going to make history? Uh, I want to be one of those that has something worth writing down about my life. And I believe that you do too. This is what we are laboring for. What we're praying for is for God to do something historic, for God to do something unprecedented, for there to be a revival. And then from the revival, it will ultimately take us into a visitation. A revival is when God does what he has already done. And there are many things that God has done that I want him to do again. But a revisitation is when God does what he has never done before. And ultimately, that is our desire, that we could be that generation that brings to bear the things that he's promised but have yet to come to pass, that in this generation we will see them fulfilled. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about investing in this future, investing in God's kingdom, investing in where we're going. And we have been spending energy... Um, uh, adjusting ourselves to uh, this present crisis. We have been spending energy trying to deal with our history. We've been spending a, a lot of energy just trying to adjust ourselves. And a lot of this is emotional because we are still hearing cases of people close to us that are suffering. This does not take away the gravity of this. This does not mean that we don't care or that we don't cry or that we are not grieved or that we do not have uh, some, some kind of, of sorrow in our souls. But for those of us that are, that are alive and well, for those of us that are here in this moment, we have been tasked with the duty of obeying God and following his commands and seeing what's coming next and preparing ourselves for that. So we're using uh, today the book of uh, 2 Samuel as a little bit of our guide today. 2 Samuel uh, chapter one gives us uh, some insights about a transition that has been happening. With our people, I've been doing on Sundays a series called Strategies for a Total Recovery. And what God gave me is, a, is basically a blueprint for recovery. There are 12 different strategies that we use. And we have talked about a few of those strategies every week as we've done the series. So I have kind of brought them down into a simple outline. But in, in, second, uh, in second Samuel, we'll, we see the transition is finally being made. One of the last steps of a, of a total recovery, when God told David, you've gone through Ziklag, you've lost everything, all of these emotions, he's spending emotion trying to process what's happened to him. He's exhausted and then he loses everything, and then God gives him a word and says, you can take it all back. You will, without fail, recover all. And we have been using this as a prophetic word for these days that we live in right now. How many believe it's God's will for us to pursue? It's God's will to overtake our enemy and to take back everything that he's stolen from us. But we also know that something else happened. He got five times more of what he lost. So I want you to stop right now. I want you to thank the Lord that we have been in a process. And some of us, it's, we're in different stages of the process. Some of you are still in the overcoming the grief state. Some of you are still in just 
recovering of your thought processes and just learning to hear God. Some of you might already be at the brook where you're being refreshed. Others are already in pursuit and some are in the process of already recalibrating all that God is taking back into your life. And so I want you to understand there's, there's a whole process. And so when you see it in one condensed form as you read it, we forget that there's days that are, that are, uh, that are written into that history and, and that there's a lot of adjustment that's made mentally and emotionally uh, during that history that is being made. And then there is a process of what comes next. And that's really what I'm trying to, to, to do today. So he, here's, the, here's how it works. We're going to stop right now. We're going to thank the Lord for what he's already done. And then we're gonna, I'm going to explain to you how we use our future as a catalyst to help us navigate our present, okay? So lift your hands right now. 1 Samuel 30 is what we've been looking at. And now we're going to 2 Samuel uh, 1 and 2. Father, we just thank you right now that you have helped us, oh God. Many of us, oh God, are at the, still in the stage of shock. Many people are still in the place, Lord Jesus, of loss, of pain and sorrow. Some have just lost people close to them. Some have just lost their job. Some are still reeling from all of the, 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 the barriers that, that of the loss of contact. And we're, and we're still alone and we're isolated and we're quiet. And we're just trying to find a way to get strong again. Strong enough to lift our hands up. Strong enough to just ask you for help and support. Others have begun to encourage themselves. And we thank you, Father, for that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for strength to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We thank you, God, for those that have already heard your voice and gotten that direction and, and you've opened up a path before us. We thank you for those that have made it to the brook and they have to just stay at the brook. They can't go any further than that. They're just in a restorative place where they just need to rest. They're out of the crisis, but they're now exhausted, and they just need that time to be renewed and, and, and just recover their faculties and their strength. We thank you, God, that there is a river for us that flows. There is a boundary that you've made that just puts us in a safe place uh, again. We thank you, God, for that, for those that have been pursuing, for those that have been aggressive, for those of us who have been strong, for those of us us that you've given us a clear word of authority and dominion and mastery in this moment. We thank you for victory right now. If you have some victory already in your life, I want you to thank the Lord for victory. If you're already experiencing some of God's favor in your life, we just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, we praise the name of the Lord. We rejoice in the blessings and the goodness of our God. And so we go from that to favor and we thank the Lord for it. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise as we just kind of just thanked him for a microcosm of what God has been doing and is still doing and will continue to do during this whole season. Now, one of the things that happened right at the end of, of, of 1 Samuel, and we'll just go back a couple chapters just for those that are catching up. Uh, let's go to 1 Samuel 30. And at the end of 1 first, uh, of first Samuel 30, 30, it says, David smote them, verse 17, even unto evening unto the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David recall, recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. There was, verse 19, there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that had been taken to them. David recovered all. This is the will of God. Whatever has been taken, God, we're going to take it back in Jesus' name. And then verse 20 says, and David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. So what meant what it meant was not only did they recover everything, but they also gained ground and they got more spoil from that victory. If you can win in this desert, if you and I can use our faith and if we can hold on to the promise of God, if we can process our past, get fully present in this moment, and then hear what God is saying to us, he is telling us that somewhere in this process, we know that Saul and his army was dying on a mountain. There was a huge shift that was going on. But what does it say? I love this. In the middle of all of this, they won a victory. And so we know the war is not over, but there's a battle that can be won right now. And as we win this battle in the name of Jesus, not only do we get back what was taken from us, we get everything that the enemy has taken. And so we know historically it was five times more 
than what they had lost. I want you to just thank the Lord that we're going to take some new territory. We're going to take some new ground. And what's so beautiful is that David put something in motion that said, for those that couldn't make the journey to pursue, they also were blessed at the brook Besor, which means that because they were in agreement and because their hearts were committed, God said, you get a share in the spoil. So I'm telling you, the power of agreement is going to release five times more into the body of Christ. There's going to be increase, and we're all going to benefit from what God is doing, regardless of what stage you're at. If you're still at the Ziklag stage, you're going to be able to feel the benefit in the spirit of those that have already conquered the Amalekites. If you're just at the brook and you're being restored, you know what? You're going to benefit from what God is doing in the body of Christ. But there is going to be a group of people that are going to be effective and effectual in prayer and that those prayers are going to avail much and we are going to win a great victory. And I believe those victories are being won right now. So I want to show you what David did. So here's the pattern for us, okay? Here's what David did, and this is what shows us how to invest. He, at, this is when you know you're totally recovered. This is, when, this is when it shows you're in the right mindset now. This is what shows you how, what victory looks like. So, so here's what I want you to see. In order for us to get out of a present crisis, we have to be able to completely process the crisis that we're in. And then faith connects to our future. And as our, as our faith connects to our future, the future begins to pull us forward, okay? That's what happens. This is the difference. This is the difference between a person who has a relationship with God and someone who does not. This is what faith does in the life of a disciple, this is what faith does. It helps us to see where God is taking us. It gives us an insight. And sometimes it's just our next step. It may not be 10 steps down the road. It may not be five years, in other words, for example. It, it may not even be a year down the road. But it's what's the next step? What's the next step? Where do I go from here? Is that if I have a next step, that gives me strength and energy and focus to manage whatever I'm in right now. But if I don't have a next step, if I am so exhausted that all I have is God help me to survive today, then I'm not recovered yet. Then what my, then what my goal is, my goal then is to be recovered. My number one goal then is to be restored. My number one goal then is just to hear God. My number one goal then is, is just to help my processing to be right processing. And that means sometimes getting rid of the wrong thoughts. So I'm you say, well, uh, Pastor Cisco, man, I, I'm, st I'm just not there yet. It's okay. It's okay. But what I'm trying to show you is that if you can see the pattern, then you'll know, okay, what comes next? You know what? I am going to get recovered. I don't have a next step yet, but I, 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 all I know is that I'm in a process of healing. I'm in a process of getting stronger. All I know is somebody else is out there moving forward and I'm in agreement with them. So there was a group of people that didn't have a next step, didn't have a next direction. All their thought was, is we're going to stay here and we'll wait. And sometimes that's where we are. We're in that waiting period where we just say, I'm in agreement with those that, that are prophetic. I, I, don't, I don't have the prophetic flow right now. I can't see the future. I'm still just trying to recover. And that's okay. But I want to tell you, there, there will be a moment in your life as you continue to process where health comes into you. And so you need to know what health is. You need to know what healthy functioning is. If all you've known is crisis and trauma and, and dysfunction and, and, and less and lack, the only way you get out of that is by changing the imprint, changing the vision. Remember the, the session that I did with Jacob where the angel told Jacob how to get the stronger sheep to reproduce the way they wanted them to reproduce. It was put the streaks into the into the into the, the trees, put poplar trees and chestnut trees in front of them and they'll reproduce what they see. And so he was teaching them the principle that if you call, if whatever you want, 
uh, to reproduce. You change the vision in front of it and it will reproduce what it sees. And so if you just keep seeing crisis, you're going to keep repeating crisis. If you keep focusing on weakness, you just repeat weakness. So there's a point when we say I'm processed through it. I had to acknowledge it. I had to put it into the hands of God. I had to process through all those emotions by, by dealing with them, by being honest about where I was at. And then in that process of talking to God and weeping and, and grieving, what do I do? I share all of this with God in his presence. And as I do, he helps me recalibrate my thinking. And then his word gives me strength. So now once, once David got got the spoils. They came back and now there's a rejoicing that's happening. The families are being reunited. They're all telling their stories. I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. The kids are saying, daddy, and they're running and they're hugging. And now they're by the, by the river Besor. And I mean, they're just, there's this huge embrace that's happening. And so what does David say? David says, the spoils are for all of us. There were some that were selfish, that their mindset was still not there. And they were saying, let them have their kids and let them have their wives and then they can leave. They didn't fight for this. They don't get this. He says, no, 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 no. That's not the right mindset. We don't take crisis mindset now that God has blessed us. And we don't, we don't let that, that thinking continue with us. That was a survival mentality. That was a crisis mentality. And that was selfishness that was speaking there. What does he do? He says, no, in the middle of this desert, we're going to give. We're going to be generous. Why? Because it's time to start thinking about the future. That when God has recovered us, when we are restored, we took back everything our enemy took from us. And folks, we're going to get there. If you're not there yet, you're going to get there. I want you to say that. Say, I'm going to take it all back. In Jesus' name. New York, you're watching right now. We're going to take it all back. In Jesus' name. We're going to be restored. We're going to be healed. We're going to be renewed. In Jesus' name. There's going to be an overflow. But I want you to think about this. I want to take the imprint of God's word. What happens? The Bible says that they began to give. And this is what he said. When David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. And I want you to notice, who does he, who does he do? Bethel, Ramath, Jatir, Ar, Sifmoth, Eshtelma, to them that were in Rachel, and to the cities of the Jeremethites, and those that were in the Kenites, to them of Horma, of Borashan, and them of Atak. Have you heard of any of those places? Maybe one or two. But these were all little cities that were not too far away from them. And the Bible says, verse 31, And to them which were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men wanted to go. So in other words, he said, I'm going to let my present go before me. I'm going to take the gifts that I got from this season. I'm going to take the victory that I won by overcoming, and that's going to release the prophetic. It's going to unlock my future. Now, this was a principle that David used his entire life. I want you to see this. This is a lifestyle principle, and it ties directly into the identity of Judah as people of praise, and it also directly ties into the anointing for the future and the leadership that God had put in him. I want to show you this. I want to show you this. Now, I think every person who has ever opened a Bible knows the story of David and Goliath, but most people miss what happens next. They know that David killed Goliath, and we know mostly that he cut off his head. Usually with Sunday school, we just say the rock hit him in the head and he fell down and he won the victory. Yay! But you know, when you read the full version, it says he cut the head off. And when he visits Saul and stands before Saul, after they won the victory, he's still holding on to the head, the gnarly big 20 pound head of Goliath. He's holding on to that head. He is keeping what he took from that battle. This is evidence. I killed this giant. I am carrying, I am carrying the head of my enemy. Now, what does he do with the head? He did something with, with, with Goliath's armor, and I'll show you that in a minute. But then he also did something with his head. He took the head of Goliath and went to Jerusalem. And he took that head and rolled it 
into down the street in Jerusalem, a place that had never been conquered, a city that had never been conquered. And he rolled the head of Goliath into that city. And he was saying, I'm going to come back one day and I'm going to take this city. I beat the giant today and I'm going to take this fortress in the future. What he was doing was literally putting a seed of, of future victories in place. He was investing. So when you win a victory, you take the head of your enemy and then you invest that into your future because you know where David would ultimately rule from? He would ultimately rule from the city of Jerusalem. He couldn't do it that day, but he was saying, I'm strong enough to be a Goliath Today, I did that by the power of God. Everyone thought it was not possible for me to kill that giant, but by God's help and in his name, I killed a giant. And guess what, Jerusalem? I'm gonna tell you, Joshua couldn't conquer you and all the generations from Joshua didn't conquer you, but I'll be back one day because I got the anointing of a king on me and when I'm a king, I'm bringing my army and I'm gonna conquer this city. So if you can kill your giant now, you can take your city then. I want you to thank the Lord right now. I want you to thank him for the victory that's coming in your life. In every victory is the seed for the next victory. Lift your hands right now and thank him. Father, I thank you that in every victory that we win, there is the seed of our future victory. If we will invest it, if we will hold on to it in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Say victory to victory. Everyone say it. Victory to victory. Say that is the will of God. Amen. Now, the second thing he did is he took the armor. And instead of taking the armor into his own tent, what did he do? He put it in the house of the Lord. And he said, this is Goliath's sword. This is Goliath's armor. And we're bringing this into God's house as a praise. He didn't take it home as his own trophy. Notice, he didn't take the head home and he didn't take the armor home. He took the head and he invested it right now because it's only good for a day. That head's only good for it. It's gonna shrivel up, it's gonna, it's gonna stink. But he says, I want everyone to feel the impact. It, the momentum is still moving. The victory is ringing out. And I want the rest of our enemies to know we beat the Philistines today. You Jebusites, we're going we're gonna to beat you tomorrow. Here's the head. Here's the proof. Of what are you going to do with that? Okay. Then he takes the armor. And instead of taking the armor home and showing his dad or showing his family or putting it up in the den, you know, and saying, there's Goliath's sword. No, what does he do? He takes it and brings it into the house of God. And he says, thank you, God, for this victory. I want every time people come into the house of God to see Goliath's sword, how big that sword was. That's a lasting praise. And so that praise became a prophetic word in his life. It became a constant reminder of victory. Every time they would go into worship, there's Goliath's sword. Every time that they would go in, they would remember the victories that they've already won. And so when David was being chased by Saul, he didn't have a sword, he didn't have bread. He went to the priest and he said, do you have anything here that I can use? He said, here's some bread, we'll feed you the bread. And then he says, well, what about a weapon? He says, well, I've got Goliath's sword here. And then now when he didn't have a weapon, when he was vulnerable and he's on the run, guess what? Now here comes the sword. And David now had grown up enough. He had matured enough. He couldn't wield that sword when he was 17. But now as a 25-year-old, now or 22-year-old, whatever it was that he was, now he, he can handle that sword. He's strong. And so this is what God is doing for us right now. He's giving us the tools that we need when we need them. And so what they, what they did next is that once you come to Hebron, this is the end of a season. He's about to go into a new season. He's about to go into that next place of reaping. He's about to go to Hebron. And from Hebron, he's going to Jerusalem. He's about to step out from being a fugitive. And he's about to be a king. So now what does he do? He does what he's always done. He invests in his future. And so I want you to believe in yourself enough. I want you to believe in the word of God that's over your life enough to invest in yourself and to invest in your future. 
I don't know what everybody else is doing right now. They can sit there and watch TV all day long, but I'm going to be in the Word. I'm going to be learning a new language. I'm going to be learning a new skill. I'm going to make the most of this. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy having a few desserts here and there, but guess what? I'm also going to focus on fasting and prayer. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to get my... If you take this time of your life, this desert is where you determine your destiny, what you're going to do. And so he takes these resources. God starts releasing resources. I believe that when God caused David to lose everything, it was to reestablish him as his only source. And that when God is his only source, then God determines what the limitations are. He can, in other words, he can raise the ceiling and we stop limiting what we can have and what we can't have based on what somebody else thinks about us. Now it's based on what God's word is over my life. He burned down Ziklag because Ziklag was a limitation. It was a limitation David put on himself. And God said, it's temporary, it's not permanent. I'm burning it down to let you know you're not supposed to stay here. So if something is burned down right now, then we have to accept, you know what? It was a limitation in my life. It was something that I didn't need or God would allow me to keep it. And so if you lost a job, you know what? Maybe God's got a better job for you. Maybe God's got a better job, or maybe you're going to go back to your job and you're going to be in a better position when you go back. I don't know what God's doing right now, but I want you to, I want you to understand that this is not the end of the story. This is not the end of your process. This is not where we die. COVID does not determine the future of the church. The church determines how we respond, and God is the one that decides what our future is. So what are we going to do? We're going to keep speaking faith in our future. We're going to keep saying, you know what? I want to go here and I want to go there. Notice, all of a sudden, these who were hiding in Ziklag are suddenly on the stage now. These who were limited in their interaction with people, suddenly, they're going to Bethel. They were in South Ramoth. I mean, and then a bunch of these other little cities, they start getting on the map and they get in scripture. Why? Because they become the, the sphere of David and his generosity. So God is about to bring a whole lot of processes into existence in our lives. A whole lot of things in us to help us to move forward in the spirit in Jesus name. Would you lift your hands again and would you thank the Lord that God is opening up a future for you, that there's open doors for you right now. There's open doors for us right now in Jesus name. Father, I want to say thank you for all of these places that we're about to go, for all these things that we're about to do, for the stage that is opening up for us in Jesus name. All right, now let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 1. We've got a few minutes. Let's talk about uh, the next steps. I want to show you how praise releases faith and how being a praiser, not just having a praise, changes your future. All right, let's look at this together. Who is going to lead is determined by our response. Now, so 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 1, now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites that David had abode two days in Ziklag. And it came to pass on the third day that behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth on his head. And so it was when he came to David, David, he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And he says, where did you come from? And he says, I came from the battle. And he says, many of the people also are fallen and are dead. Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And so he, he asks him who he is, verse number eight, who are you? And he says, I am an Amalekite. And so this is an Amalekite that Saul was supposed to kill. And now Saul is uh, finished off by an Amalekite. And the Amalekite is reporting in to David. See, if you don't kill the enemy when you can, that enemy will be there when you're dying to kill you. We must destroy every part of the sin in our lives, not just most of it. We have to get rid of all of the negative thoughts in our life, not just most of them. We have to be determined to be submitted to God 100%, that we are 100% obedient, and that God can work with us completely and entirely. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with everything. By God's grace, this is what we will do. And so we see this is the epitaph. And David, when he hears this news, he understands the ramifications. He just went through a crisis personally, okay? He and his men personally just went through something. So prophetic people oftentimes go through pain 
just ahead of everyone else. Prophetic people go through suffering ahead of everyone else. Think about Joseph. Joseph suffered before his family suffered. He experienced everything that the global famine would, would experience. Everyone that you, everything that you would experience in a global famine, Joseph experienced. He was hungry. He was, he was a slave. He was beaten. He was bullied. He was marginalized. He was lied on. He was deceived. He was thrown into prison and he was forgotten. All of those things are things that happen to you when you are in a famine. He experienced it all. But on the other side, he interprets a dream. And by interpreting a dream, he rises up, masters his moment. And because he mastered his personal moment, he was able to be prophetic for the rest of the world. God always does this with the prophets. Take the example of the prophets, the Bible says, for a picture of suffering. So if you want to know how to suffer well, he said, look at the prophets and observe the prophets. Because their suffering is our example. Through their suffering, they purchase the promise. Through the suffering, they're able to go ahead of everyone else so they can give us a prophetic word when we need it. So God often uses people on, on smaller scales to go through something extreme because the rest of the world is either going through it now or is about to go through it. And so David has just gone through this with the Amalekites and now he hears this is what's happening in the nation. So folks, before we can lead the nation, we have to lead ourselves, lead our families, lead our groups. We have to be faithful in the little things before we can be faithful in much. So if we're going to lead effectively, that means that we have to learn to thrive in that desert and we have to take back what the enemy has stolen from us. We have to hear God clearly and be obedient. And then as we come out, of this, there is a there is an understanding and a revelation that now postures us, and he's in a position of resources, he's in a position of generosity, and he's ready to help, and he's ready to heal. And now they come to him and they say, Saul is dead. The nation is grieving. They're going through a massive void right now, and there's a huge shift. And what's happening is this anointing on David is suddenly rising up in him. And the first thing he says is, if you thought this was good news, that Saul is dead, you thought wrong. Not in this camp. And he killed the man that brought him bad news. He killed the man that thought that he was being political and positioning himself to get a reward. You're not getting any reward for this. He said, this is your reward his blood be on your own head. And then David laments. Now this is, this is part of the beauty of David's life and relationship is that he was able to take a moment of deep pain and loss and suffering. And because of this wellspring of the Holy Spirit and this connection with God in his life, he was able to bring in something poetic. He was able to write a song. I once did a study of all the Psalms when they were written, and it was at every change or at every juncture of David's life, he wrote another Psalm because this was his habit. This was his lifestyle is that when I'm pressed, I sing. When I'm pressed, I write. When I'm pressed, I am poetic. When I'm pressed, I, I always refer back to the highest and the best. I capture. Notice what he is saying. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. What is he doing? This was a huge loss in Israel. And he is saying, these were great men. These were awesome men. Let's lament them. Let's hold on to the greatness. Let's, let's remember what they gave us. Let's, let's receive the seeds of, of all of the nobility that was in them. And let's, let's capture that. Let's hold that. Ye daughters of Saul, weep. He is saying, this is how you process. I just went through it. I just wept. You weep. There are some things and some parts of the transition that we just have to mourn over. There's just some parts of this process. And we know some of our great men and our great women of God, some saints of God, this is their final stage for them. Some have passed on. We have the Eli Hernandez that, that, we that we're mourning right now, that we're great prophets of God. And, and this was their time. And we say, you were stronger than a lion and you were swifter than an eagle, Eli. We love you and we thank you for everything that you've invested. We will take those seeds. We will take your messages. We will take your prayers. We will take your prophecies and we will apply them. And so this is what he, he talks about this. He mourns properly. I think part of being emotionally healthy is that we have to know how to properly mourn. 
But once the mourning is finished, 2 Samuel chapter 2, what do we see? And it came to pass after this, after what? After writing the song, after mourning, after understanding what's happened, after doing what he can to speak life into all of the void. What happens? He begins to pray again. At every juncture in our lives, we have to fast and pray for our next step, our next step. So what was it? David's, David's immediate direction, invest in your future, invest in your future, invest in your future, be generous to people. And he's, and he's being generous to people. He's giving, he's giving. So what we see is, is basically there was an up close shot of the third day after he came back to the camp when he learned this about Saul and he mourned. But the rest of 1 Samuel 30 tells us that this is what he did over the several days and weeks that went after coming back to Ziklag is he was generous and he gave, he invested, he invested. And the Bible says it came to pass after this. There was a season of investing. And then it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord and said, is there something I'm supposed to do? He was waiting. There was a shift in himself. And I'm going to ask you, for those of you that are starting to feel the shift right now, you start investing in that future. You start asking God, what am I supposed to do next? Is there a change? What am I, where am I supposed to focus? This is what we do right now. When you are healthy, emotionally healthy, mentally clear, when you're physically strong, and now you have resources that God is flowing into your life, there is a resource of the energy of life. There is a resource of, of his spirit. There is the anointing of God. There is the listening and the hearing, our capacity to hear God. There's the anointing. There are resources of people. There are resources of skill, and there are finances. All of these things start flowing because there's something massive that's happening. There's this huge shift that's going on. And I want you to understand that this thing is so massive, it's so big, that we cannot quite get our minds all around it. So it has to take incremental shifts in our life, incremental steps. It's like the massive ships that are going up, uh, to, that are changing from one waterway to another. They'll go through a lock. And as they, they lock in, then the water goes up and then the lock comes down and the ship moves forward and then the water drains out and then water comes up again and they go through the lock and it's shift by shift. They go up and then they go forward. They go up and then they go forward. This is what God is doing. He's incrementally moving us up and moving us forward. And then all of a sudden the gate comes down and we're in a total new dimension. This is what's happening here with these strategies that David is using uh, that God is teaching him, the things that he's learning. He is going into new places he's never been before, and God is helping him to invest in places he's never invested. And the Bible says, finally, the last place he invested was Hebron. And it came to pass as he's praying, shall I go up to any of the cities in Judah? And the Lord said, yep, it's time to leave Ziklag. It's time to move out of this city that's been burned down, and it's time to move forward into your destiny. It's time to move into a new season. It's time to make the shift. Are you feeling it right now? Can you sense it in the Holy Ghost right now? Lift your hands to the Lord. Give him praise right now. Behold, those that I have chosen, says the Lord, those who I have sworn that I am with, I will not deny you. I will keep you as, a, as, the, as the apple of the eye. I will protect you and watch over you, says the Lord, for my name is in you and you are my people. And this is my time, says the Lord. The enemy has sought to seize upon those who were vulnerable and those who were weak. And there were some parts of my, of my church that had to be adjusted and judgment, as I have said in my word, must begin at the house of the Lord. So I have judged my house, says the Lord, and I have finished with that judgment for this season. More judgments will come in the future, but for this season, I have finished my judgment. And those that I have put my hand upon, I am now tapping. I am now unlocking. I am now releasing. I am now anointing, says the Lord, and new strategies will come to you. New steps I will show you and open doors will begin to come. Behold, all of my people shall feel the power of the prophetic, but there shall be hubs 
There shall be certain cities which I have chosen in which I shall cause there to be a concentration of the prophetic. And there shall be others that will have a concentration of apostolic ministry. Still others will be a concentration of those who are being trained and taught. I shall have others which will be great evangelistic centers where just as quickly as they come in, I shall disperse them to other places and they shall be a part of a massive global harvest. They will come and be healed. They will come and be delivered. They will come and be saved. And then I will send them to the nations, says the Lord. For behold, this is a day of ingathering, and this is also a day of sending, says the Lord. I am opening it up even now. Receive it. Receive this fresh insight that I do give you today. Open your eyes and see, for I am making the path plain before you, and I am giving you permission to move forward, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo! If that bears witness with you right now, lift your hands and lift your voice and receive it in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you just clap your hands right where you are in Jesus' name. I want you to just say, I receive it. If you have received this word, if it resonated with you, if you're close by a phone, if you can, if you feel like you want to, you might still be praying, it's okay. But if you got your phone in your hand, just give me a thumbs up or an amen uh, and let me know that you received this word from the Lord, that it resonates with you in Jesus' name. God is giving us permission to leave our burnt down ziklag and move into a new season. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to see where God took him. And David said, where shall I go up? And he said, unto Hebron. The place that you invest in, you didn't even know. There was all these people he invested in. There was all these communities that he invested in. But the last one that he invested in was the one that God sent him to go to. He said, I'm sending you to Hebron. God says, I'm sending you to a city of refuge. Hebron was a city of refuge of refuge. And he said, you're going to lead from there. Our step out of this crisis, our step out of COVID, our step out of the pandemic, as long as it takes, there's going to be people in all different stages. I want to reiterate this, but as the prophetic word is being fulfilled step by step, this is the direction. So I want you to throw a seed forward into Hebron and you might still be living in Ziklag with a, in a burnt down city. But I want you to have that seed cast into your future. I want you to invest in that. I want you to say, God, I'm going to Hebron. God, I'm going to get out of this crisis. God, this is not going to destroy me and my family. I thank you, Father. I'm taking it all back. I'm going to walk out of here blessed. I don't know how you're going to do it. I just know you're going to do it. I remember I went through a season, and I've talked about this many times, but I want to talk about the end of it so that you can see some principles about, about the story. But right as I was entering into it, God spoke to me, said, this is a season of pain and loss and suffering. And as he told me that, I knew, I knew that it was not going away anytime soon. It was gonna be a protracted season. For us, it was two and a half years. It was a two and a half year uh, season for us where I wept every day, my wife, my wife wept every day, uh, but we got very, very close to the Lord during that time. And at the end of that season, as God was transitioning us out, we were, we were just so raw. We had lost so much. And yet God had sustained us. He had protected us, He'd taken care of us. We didn't die. And actually, emotionally, we actually were, were perfected a lot. We had grown a lot. Because the Bible says he uses suffering to perfect us. He uses it to, to establish us and to settle us and to make us perfect, according to First uh, Peter um, there, 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 there's a trial that tries us. And for a little while, he says, you're in this trial. When it's compared to your whole life, it's just a little while. But while you're in it, it's gruesome every day. But God is doing deep works of change in us. When I came to the end, I, I moved back to Texas from St. Louis. And we came to a little town called Rockwall, a beautiful little town. And I remember being in a little rented house that we had. We didn't buy. We just rented a little house. And it was just by favor that we were even in this house. And I was standing there and I said, God, I've lost a lot. I've lost years, years of savings, years of investing. 
uh, I, my partners, my, my ministry, I've lost so much during this time. And I know that this was a season that you put me in and I thank you for all that I have also gained and learned during this time. But am I just supposed to accept my losses? Am I just supposed to emotionally just, just say, okay, in other words, did I do something that caused this? Was it somehow a big weakness? And I asked God, I said, was this my enemy or was this me? If it was me making really bad choices, then I have to bear that responsibility. And I realized that I have made some poor choices in my life and I didn't always get it right. And I repented. I said, so God, if this is the cause of, of some of the things happening, is it because I wasn't in right position because I haven't done enough right things? I, I want to repent enough, and, I, and if this is something I just have to endure, then I'll endure it. I said, but if this was my enemy that came in while I was vulnerable, if this was my enemy that did all this while, while I was in a state where I was stretched so thin, that, then God, that I want to know that, should I go after it? Should, should I fight for it? Should I, should I expect? Should I pray for recovery? And a wind blew past my shoulder like this, and I heard a whisper, and it just said, pursue. And when I heard that word, something came into me. I was so exhausted. I was emotionally just wiped out. But when I heard God say pursue, then I knew that God had released me or forgiven me of any sins or any mistakes that I had made. And he was saying, you're going to go and take back everything that the enemy has taken from you. Pursue that word from the Lord helped me to put something into my future way ahead and say, I'm going to get it all back. I'm going to take it all back. I'm, I'm going to rule. I'm going to reign. I'm going to lead. I'm going to, everything that you said I was going to be, God, it's still on. Everything that you promised me, it's still on. And I want you to know, this is what David did when he encouraged himself in the Lord. He said, I'm still anointed. I still have a promise over my life. And so when he's investing in Hebron, guess what? This is the overflow now of what God has done. This is the, this is the principle of faith at work in his life. And now what's going on? Now what's going on? Here he is in Hebron, and suddenly he's a king. Wow. He went from Ziklag being the highest possibility for his life to now Hebron being an open door for the future. And I want you to see right now that maybe, just maybe, the church had been so limited by its thinking and limited by the way it was bound inside of its structure of 10 o'clock on Sunday and 7 o'clock on Wednesday and we meet in a building and then we go about our lives. Maybe we were able to function inside of that for a season and for a time, but God was saying there's something bigger than that that I want to do. I want to give you a global harvest and you need to be daily in my presence, not just weekly or just two times a week. You don't need to just be in a building somewhere. You also need to be in your homes and out in the parks and walking down the streets and, and you need to be singing and you need to be rejoicing and you need to be on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and wherever else that you can broadcast. You need to broadcast and get your Zoom fellowships and get your online texting and your, and your websites going and, and get your call centers going and your prayer lines going and, and reach out and touch people and make a difference and get your signs on your card and do Operation Spread Hope. All of this while we were suffering, all of this while we don't know what's happening next, all of this while the economy is going down, all of a sudden the church is going up and people are open to God and people are getting the Holy Ghost. A great testimony. Brother Jose Herrera told me this the other day. He said, you were doing a broadcast, Pastor, so I thought, I'll do my own little broadcast and I'll tell what God is saying to me and I'll pray with people online. And he sent me a text that one of the people that connected with him on his Facebook page got the Holy Ghost. Now that would have never happened. That would have never happened. Here's our TCT ladies on Zoom. That's right, Rosie. I mean, just lighting, lighting it up, having these two-hour prayer meet, that would have never happened. So God burned down our Ziklag. Okay, God shut it all down. We're going to come back to a building that's going to have new carpet. It's going to have new sound and new lights and chairs. And it's going to have a better cafe. And it's going to all these upgrades to the building. Okay, we're going to have that. So God's going to upgrade the building. But in the meantime, he's totally recalibrating how we do what we do. Because the church is not a building. It's people. And so we're investing. We're investing. We're investing. We're investing. And God is saying, I'm going to use it. This pandemic is going to end, but the church is going to go forward into the greatest revival, into the greatest harvest that we've ever seen. And we're going to lead it. The people that make the adjustments that are the prophetic praisers 
are going to lead it. I want you to notice that that this was the result of this was the result of prayer. This was the result of the prophetic, but this is also the result of David's attitude of praise and worship. Who is Judah? Judah equals praise. Thank God. So tomorrow I'm going to do another session about uh, when Judah takes the lead, and we'll share that with you. And we're going to get into a little bit deeper uh, foundation, the root structure of David going all the way back to the patriarch. We'll go back and talk about that tomorrow. But today, I want you to see this, that the leaders are the praisers. When you can start praising, that's when you know something has shifted in your life. When your default, notice David, David's told about Saul, his default, oh, he starts to weep and then he starts to sing. I'll never forget a great songwriter, great, great songwriter. Uh, that I had a chance to know and be up close with. He, he wrote, just to walk with him means everything to me. He also wrote, day stars shine down on me. Steve Richardson, let your love flow through me in the night. Lead me, Lord, I follow everywhere you want me to go. Oh, let your word speak to me. Show me things I've never seen before, before. Oh man, I was, he would sing that, we would weep. I got to be really close with him. He was a part of a team that I was on and we traveled the country uh, doing uh, singles conferences uh, many, many years ago. And he was, the main, he was one of the main people that played and I was one of the day speakers. I was part of the team uh, with Brother Stone King. I did this for about four years. I would do about four or five conferences a year and he'd be there and it, it, was, it was so special just to hear him and to be around him. He was single, never married. He, his, his one woman in his life was his mom. And he would go home. He would take the little bottles from the hotel and bring the little shampoo bottles. His mom didn't have a whole lot of money. And he'd bring her the shampoo bottles. And he said, I'm bringing these home for my mom. It was just, just really sweet. And, uh, and I remember he, he, his mom died while we, during a conference. And they told us first. And they, they kind of tasked me to go in and to talk to Steve. And so me and the pastor that we were with, we went in and um, we walked in his hotel room and said, Steve, we're, we're so sorry. We have to tell you this today, but your mom passed this morning. And the tears came down his face. He began to weep. And the first words out of his mouth was, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will bless the Lord at all times. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. He started quoting scriptures, and he started praising. And I thought, this is the man that can write a song like this, is that when he's told that the most important person in his life is gone, the first thing he did was not charge God foolishly, but to praise. And somehow, with all of the loss, and with all the pain, and all the trials, and all the testing that we're feeling right now, we have to make up our minds that we keep trusting God enough to praise Him. Father, I thank You. I thank You. I can bless your name today. I can praise your name today. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You work all things together for our good. Everything is for your purpose. We don't always understand, Lord, but we trust you. And we say, God, let our default be praise. Let our default, oh God, let it be to worship because we'll praise our way out of this pandemic. We will worship our way out of all of our weakness. We will exalt you, oh God, and you will inspire us. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name for a future that is waiting to be decided. And I thank you for the leaders that you have chosen right now to emerge with a word, with a message, and to release all of the anointing 
that has been cultivated, cultivated in that desert, in that wilderness, in Jesus' name. We love you. God bless you. And we'll talk to you again tomorrow.